All right. So, you got a friend and your friend and your friend. <laughs> so, before I go on, I just want to mention something that's really cool about my mitochondrial DNA is that you always inherit your mitochondrial DNA from your mother. So, you could do uh, these kind of maternal genealogies using mitochondrial DNA. So, me as a male, I also have, well, most males have a Y chromosome at least. And so I could look at my paternal lineage that way, and I could look at my maternal lineage from my mitochondrial DNA for that reason. You always get that from your mom, which I think is really quite fascinating. Um, yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm Brad. I was here yesterday, but for those of you who don't uh, know me or I'm just introducing myself for the first time, I have a PhD in biological design. Uh, if you want to know more about me, you can visit my website at sciencethirst.com. And also, you can check me out on uh, Twitter or Instagram. Uh, okay, so briefly, very briefly, what are bacteria? So bacteria are single-celled microorganisms. Um, archaea are single-celled uh, single microorganisms as well. They're kind of similar to bacteria, but different. And I'm not going to go into those too much, but just so you know, there is something else out there as well. Um, they have a large uh, loop chain DNA. So they, they basically, most bacteria have what we would call circular DNA. So this is different from our DNA in that uh, we generally have chromosomes that are kind of linear. And then they have these telomeres at the end. And then all of our chromosomes have pairs. And we get a karyotype. And in bacteria, for the most part, they don't have these telomeres because they don't have ends. They just kind of have these loops. And those loops kind of turn into this big loop chain that is in the cell. Um, yeah, so I think it's a pretty good intro on bacteria. Uh, they also come in all kinds of shapes, forms, sizes, whatever. Um, and so we have different ways that we can define a bacterial cell, whether it's a rod or uh, a sphere, or whether it has flagella or it doesn't, or maybe it can look like some spaghetti noodles, whatever. So there are lots of different kinds of bacterial shapes out there. And this is kind of cool to look at if you ever get a, a, a microscope, a, an electron microscope, or sometimes even a light microscope. You can see, you know, these little small circles on there, and uh, that's really, really a cool experiment uh, that you can do. And so, within the world uh, today, we're going to be talking about bacteria that are associated with us. And I love to say that bacteria are our friends, and bacteria do lots of cool things for us. Bacteria are a crucial part of our evolution. Um, as we mentioned earlier, bacterial cells outnumber ours 10 to 1 so associated with our bodies. They help defend us from pathogens, the bacteria that are on our hands. But at the same time, we can't be naive to the fact that there are also some bad players out there, right? So there are some bacteria that try to get into Comic-Con with stuff that they shouldn't. <laughs> so we have some bacteria that are flesh-eating. Uh, which we have here with uh, Streptococcus. Uh, we have tuberculosis, uh, which is also bad news bears, and we also have uh, meningitis, right? These are also pretty infamous bacteria uh, that we've all heard of and want to defend ourselves against. There's also the, uh, the emerging problem of antibiotic resistant bacteria. So these are basically pathogens or bacteria that get into you and infect you, and we have no way to treat. So this can be very, very dangerous, uh, very, very quickly. Right? So now that we have the, the bad guys out of the way, um, I want to focus on the good guys. So the good bacteria, what do good bacteria do for us? Well, or good microbes? Well, they can help us do things like make cheese and make yogurt and treat our wastewater, right? So. Every time, every time we go to the bathroom, that has to go somewhere, and conventional wastewater treatment now, for example, the wastewater. So if you ever go to the new Cubs Stadium in Mesa, right right behind it, you see these big domes that look like Epcot Center, right? So you know what I'm talking about? So these big domes are part of a fermentation tank that's part of a larger wastewater treatment plant. And essentially what you do there is you ship in all the poop and that goes into vats of bacteria, and we pump air into those vats, and the bacteria eat our poop, right? So that's how we do wastewater treatment. So you can think bacteria for that. Where do we get the bacteria to do that? Well, lucky for us, that bacteria comes in in your poop as well, so you're constantly giving us the supply we need. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the employee. 
employees and the money to pay them. I love it. <laughs> so here's an interesting article that came out of The Economist in 2012. It was talking about, okay, the microbes make it man, and it's this idea that microorganisms in humans are really, really closely tied together in this uh, uh, evolutionary trade-off, if you will. And uh, because of this, you know, in 2003, kind of the Human Genome Project wrapped up officially, so we have the whole human genome mapped, and we were going to solve the answers to all of the diseases in human history, right? We have the human genome now, and yet we don't have the answers to all of those questions. Why are there still diseases out there that we can't treat or we can't diagnose, right? What are we not seeing in the human genome? And so it got some people thinking, and in 2008, they started another project called the Human, Micro, uh, human Microbiome Project. And this project is looking at now we have enough bacteria associated with our bodies to where their genes outnumber ours a thousand to one. So maybe there's something going on there that we need to be paying more attention to. And so they started uh, looking at and mapping all of the genes that are associated with the bacteria that are associated with our bodies. And uh, they were looking at all kinds of areas. So they're looking at eyes, ears, uh, uh, testes, vagina, butt, uh, uh, gut, mouth, everything that you can think of they're looking at. Uh, now specifically they're looking at it in terms of uh, pregnancy. So how does your uh, microbiome change uh, during pregnancy and throughout pregnancy? How does it change in terms of diagnosing type 2 diabetes, things like that? So this project started in 2008. It was meant to be a five-year project and it's still going strong because we keep unraveling every day more and more information about how important these microorganisms that are associated with our bodies are. And so who's next? Well, we okay. Thank you. Hello everybody, I'm Joe, and I'm here real quick to just tell you that even though we focus on the microbiome right now, there's a new field coming up, which is the microbiome. So here is a sort of, oh no. <laughs> here's, a, here's a breakdown of the different kinds of bacteria that are found in different areas of your body. And then up here, you have uh, your human, your human sequence, you have your bacterial sequence, and this is your viral sequence. So we, have, we are made up of almost 70% viral genes in our body opposed to that one in 1,000 of microbial to human. So we're made up of more virus than we are of anything else, and we sort of ignore it up until now, in the past couple of years. And it's just something I want to bring forward when you guys are thinking about everything that's been presented and what's going to be presented, because we're going to go into some specifics. And we really don't know those specifics yet about viruses and the virome and how all that affects us. The one thing that I know about in depth is uh, if, if you've ever been pregnant, when someone's who's been pregnant, the doctors probably said, don't go around your cat's litter box. And the reason for that is there's a virus in there that can damage the fetus. But if a healthy person is infected by the virus and gets the infection to their brain, in females, it makes their sex drive higher, and in males, it makes their sex drive lower. We have no idea why that is, what the virus is doing or trying to do there. It's a protozoan. It's, it's, oh, no. Yeah, it's not, it's not a virus. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, I'll just get off stage now. Anyway, <laughs> there, are, there are other, well see, that just proves my point that we don't know anything really about the virome. And also, I mean, I confused it, so obviously we don't know much about protists either. We just mainly focus on the microbiome right now. And we should expand that, is my whole point with all these slides. And I have two, because I'm just here to answer questions. And this over. <laughs> studying what the bio at ASU, um, and I, well, I, 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 I'll be honest, I procrastinate like a lot, all right, like probably an unhealthy amount, and while preparing for this presentation, I was just looking at pictures of bat mice on Google, because <laughs> <laughs> they're adorable. Um, and we use a lot of mice in research, not my research, I don't play a biotechnologist, but a lot of people use mice. So I got this thing, 
this cute little potato of a mouse. And I was like, oh my gosh, how did you get so fat? <laughs> No, I had to think, the answer has to be microbes, okay? It's microbes, it's got to be microbes, it can't be microbes. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, um, I figured that this mouse had something wrong with its microbes because it wasn't, my, my stuff normally look like this, okay? Like they're, they're, a, little bit, they're a little bit small. Um, and so I figured that there's something wrong with mice's microbes. So here's a little bit of background. Uh, microbes are really good at eating things, all right? Like, we have our friends that like to eat all of our pizza, all of our food when they come over to our houses. The panel is like, you've got a friend you knew. This is the friend that just eats like everything, okay? <laughs> and they, they're really good at eating, literally. Like, they're microbes like, that eat nuclear waste, they eat frogs, they eat enemies, they'll get like the copy abilities from those enemies, you know? They, <laughs> that happens. Like, actually, if you get sick, you can end up having your gut microbes if you take like the DNA from the infectious bacteria and integrate that into their own DNA. That's a thing for another panel. Um, <laughs> suffice to say, they're really good at eating everywhere, they help us digest stuff. So what does that mean for us? I mean, like we like to eat lots of food, they like to eat lots of food, we have lots in common. Uh, well, our diets are a little bit different. So we really like so we, we really like starch, all right? But our body really likes glucose. They're individual hexagons. Starch is a polysaccharide, the bane of digestion. It sounds like an epic item you'd get like Skyrim or Warcraft, but it's actually just a scientific term that refers to a large conglomeration of a chain of several hexagonal uh, like sh uh, sugar molecules, uh, and that's what a starch is. We have trouble digesting starch because it's in this giant packaged format. It's really kind of scary when you think about it, because you have this enormous like amount of really good stuff that you just can't get to it. You can't get those yummy, delicious hexagons you need to make ATP. So what do we do? We send the microbes. The microbes eat them. They eat tons of them. They just destroy the bonds between these little hexagons here and free them up for us to eat and turn it into delicious ATP, which I'm sure some of you know is the energy currency of the body. It's what the mitochondrial makes. It's why it's the mitochondrial powerhouse of the cell, et cetera, et cetera. Bio means our waste is late, okay? These microbes poop out glucose molecules and a whole lot of other really cool stuff. Well, we just poop crap. <laughs> crap. These guys might argue that that's a good thing we can turn into other really cool applicable things like power and energy, but I'll let them talk about that. But it's nice to say these friends of ours are really good at eating things and it helps us. Why is that? Well, it turns out they're really good at actually giving us energy that we need. So, because some scientists have way too much free time on their hands, they were like, hey, what would happen if we grew a mouse without any microbes inside of it? Wouldn't that be cool? Like, they'd just be like, yeah, why not? Let's just go for it. So they did, of course. That's what scientists do. They do things. They grew mice without any gut microbes whatsoever. And it turned out these mice ended up being pretty lean. I mean, they were pretty fit. They definitely didn't look like this. They looked a little bit more like this, but even thinner. They, they were healthy, though. They weren't, like, in pain or anything. I'm not sure of that. Um, and then they were like, okay, well, we, we managed to make these mice without germs. What happens when we give them germs? <laughs> <laughs> so they took the germs from a normal mouse, and they gave them to the mouse that was, like, being and grown without any germs, brought without any germs, and it turned out the mice became obese and developed diabetes. <laughs> <laughs> but what it proved is that microbes help digest energy-rich like energy -rich molecules that they couldn't digest, and it makes it so they can actually consume more of the food that they're eating. Like, they can actually use more of the food. Microbes make our digestive systems way more efficient so that we can stop being this cute and become this cute. <laughs> so, aside from like making people cute and nice cute again by helping us like digest more of the food that we're eating, what else did they do? Well, uh, remember how like our poop is kind of lame? Well, their poop is awesome, okay? Like, they produce really cool stuff from the stuff that they eat. They produce proteins and vitamins and, and companionship and just so much wonderful stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it makes us way healthier. I mean, could you, like, they basically take these molecules, including like cellulose, this fiber sometimes, they can ferment this cellulose, they can ferment these starches, and create these wonderful products. And it really helps you make, you make you a lot healthier. You guys would probably be not here today, you'd probably be in a hospital, without your gut microbes being in check. And it works the way they do, because they produce so many essential products that we need to live. All right, 
So last but not least, we have the future. So like obviously this is all really cool science, you know, you have these wonderful friends in you, but we all want better friends. Honestly. <laughs> we want better friends. We don't want the friends that eat like everything, everything. Like, we want to have some food to eat for ourselves too. Um, so if we can like feed those friends that want to eat our pizza, like our vegetables and stuff that we don't want to eat, that'd be really great. Turns out some people have lactose intolerance. Who knew? It's a thing. Um, so Lactose is a double hexagonal thing, it's called a disaccharide, it has two sugars in it, and some people don't have the enzyme lactase to digest it. Some people have thought that if we could give them microbes as like a microbe therapy, microbes that can digest lactose for them, they might actually be able to eat things that are delicious again. Because, I'm sorry Andy, we've never got out to pizza because you can't eat pizza. <laughs> it hurts my friendship ability. And microbes can help me have better friends and more fun friends. Sorry. Of course, there's also the probiotic effect. Uh, some people think that they could uh, use microtherapy, give these some people that have like uh, terrible uh, exposure to like diarrhea-causing pathogens, like uh, children in Africa and developing countries with like low access 